If you're visiting us, this isn't usually how it goes, but today's a very special day. A day for pluralism, for speaking of my notes. Right? Question, friends, what does it mean to be a neighbor? To love your neighbor, even? Of course, there is religiously loaded language here. But we all use the word neighbor in a colloquial sense. The folks across the street and across the street and over yonder, these are our neighbors. We use this as a term of proximity to relationship. Maybe someone who isn't quite a friend or a family member, but is a neighbor nonetheless. But this word has religious meat to it, tofu to it, pardon me. Your protein of choice. I'm trying to say love two birds with one hand as opposed to, you know. But this loving your neighbor is understood in the Christian tradition as the highest commandment. And indeed in the Hebrew Bible, God calls upon the people to love your neighbor, the book of Leviticus. The Reverend Fred Rogers understood this too. The idea of a neighbor is more than just who lives next to you. It's more than just proximity and distance. It's a way of being and being in relationship to others, making room for relationships to grow. Fred didn't call people acquaintances or friends, boys or girls, ladies and gentlemen. No, he called us neighbors. Really great non-binary inclusive language too. The term neighbor has this religious quality. In the book of Luke, Jesus is confronted by a scholar who is kind of trolling Jesus, and Jesus asked that question, I asked you too, well, okay, well, who is your neighbor? And Jesus, like Fred, Fred Rogers, answers in a story. The story we might know as the tale of the Good Samaritan, a Samaritan in this context, is a person who is outside of the bounds of power, a disliked person, just to count on who, of who they are and where they come from. People don't do that today, do they? Oh, I think they do. But so, Put, put, put this person in there. Put this person in the space of the Samaritan. And, but before we get to the Samaritan, there's a man on the road who has been injured gravely. He's hurt. And passing him is a merchant and a priest and all these important highfalutin people of society. And nobody stops. And the Samaritan sees him and is moved by compassion to help this stranger who would be a neighbor takes them to the inn, buys them food, tends to them, and goes about their way, not for the sake of thanks or reward, but because they were moved by compassion. We've talked about compassion here before. Compassion, the etymology of which, calm with passion to suffer, doesn't necessarily mean to suffer with, but to be with the suffering, to be with what hurts in this world and what hurts in our neighbor and what hurts in us too, friends, indeed. You're called to be good neighbors to ourselves, to love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot draw from an empty well. We must practice this kindness towards ourself, thus we can give it back out to the world and draw those circles wider and magnify love as such to letting justice remove every obstacle from love so that love's demands can be fulfilled. Jesus asks his tricky interlocutor, which one of you of these do you think was the neighbor? Was it the merchant or the priest? Or, and though perhaps you can't believe he's saying so, the scholar answers, the one who demonstrated mercy. Fred Rogers called us neighbors when he hosted his show in the neighborhood for over 30 years. He was calling us gently but firmly out of our systems and structures of power and our silos of sameness into these lives of mercy and to care for one another. Now, admittedly, Fred might have been too optimistic. Maybe Jesus was too optimistic, too, for that matter, calling us something better than we actually are. But maybe he believed that if he got us while we were young, if he told us again and again and again and again and again that we were good enough, that we were worthy enough, that we were lovable, that we could extend mercy, maybe we could grow into real neighbors to one another. Maybe we still can. You know, maybe we're too optimistic here as well too optimistic about what could be possible in a community who fosters a welcome so warm that it takes on the quality and the character of the sacred itself. Maybe, maybe. Optimism is only folly when it's tainted with pride, believing it above reproach and fundamentally unteachable. A real neighbor is moved by compassion, 
moved by that which calls us to attend to the brokenhearted, to the stranger, to go if only a little farther than the bounds of our comfort may allow. And why? Because kindness, this kind of kindness, this term neighbor we are evoking, these aren't just some feel-good hypotheticals. It's the raw stuff of living. But here at least, let us consider who our neighbor is. One who was once a stranger but is no longer. One becomes a neighbor via a welcome, by living alongside and learning about one another. This is how we become known and know others in turn. The first seed of beloved community is a conversation that which allows love to grow. It begins with a presence, a word, a connection, mutual desire to grow closer till one is no more a stranger and is perhaps more than a neighbor, a fellow traveler towards home, a fellow seeker after life, truth and love, a friend even. The most precious thing in the world are those close relationships. May this be such a place where those relationships can begin and be nurtured and grow into something wild and beautiful and forever free. What more could church be about in an age of polarization and dislocation where people do not know their neighbors? But that, the seeds we plant and tend here, not in finance or effort necessarily, no, just in love, just in the saying hello and being together. If that is all we did, I believe that would be enough. We do more though, right? We do more because that love can't be contained. It won't be contained. It must go out and do something to spread itself amongst the world. Systems that can't grow and adapt, well, they're bound to break. We do try to find the sacred wherever we can. I think this among many things is what makes this such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful church to serve and to be in. Oh, but friends, I would love to speak to you about borders and boundaries. What do we mean by these terms? But they often get used interchangeably, right? Borders and boundaries. For the purposes of this, at least, I'd like you to imagine with me that borders are that which goes on the outside edge, and boundaries are the inside edge. And this is driving me bonkers, so give me just one second. I don't know. That's okay. They didn't teach us sound design in, in seminary. So our friends in the narthex, it's over now. You're welcome to come back. With sound sensitivities, y'all. I feel you. I don't like that either. Um, where are we here? Borders. The outer edge. The boundary, the inner edge. It kind of makes sense when you think about it. We human animals who, for the better part of our history, had no such thing as a civilization. We didn't have a lot of things. Civilization has brought us a lot. I'm not here to denigrate civilization or necessarily all borders all the time, all structure and boundaries, no. But the rigidity of a thing, I believe, can really break hearts. Can break hearts if we don't have systems that are capable of growing and changing and adapting. These become instruments of death, frankly. Instruments that cannot see the full breadth of humanity in another. And of course, our current immigration protocol has been like this for a long time, too long. The arbitrary way in which some these are, laws are often enforced, will it be today that a person who's undocumented gets pulled over, gets deported? Maybe not. It depends on the officer frequently. It depends on the state that you're in. The callous disregard for young people who have to go and testify before a judge before they can open a box of cereal even. And yet these people are often called an invading force, folks seeking a new life for themselves. I speak of it not only because it's Cinco de Mayo, friends, it, partly. We have also renewed our contract with the Iglesia de Apostolica, Spanish-speaking apostolic congregation who will be in the space this afternoon from two to four. And I understand this congregation to be a people who take pluralism seriously, who take the magnification of love and the expanding of our understanding seriously, because it's serious work. This is 
not the only thing being a Unitarian Universalist is about, but this is a big part of who we are, to be in the presence of the breadth, of the spectrum of humanity. Diversity, diversity entails a kind of strength, a wild strength that can't be controlled by people who control too much, like it's a pathology, but it has a power all its own not just for the sake of there being different kinds of people, but by those people coming together and weaving their lives together. That is where the magic happens, friends. It can happen in places like this. It can happen in places anywhere, really. Anywhere where love finds ground to sprout something new, something beautiful, something free. A hello, how are you, a visit an attempt to expand our capacities for how we speak, think even, because welcoming the stranger, welcoming the neighbor is not always easy. Sometimes we might have to learn how to say a different thing or do a different thing. We may have to learn how to think differently, right? Does it happen all at once? Doesn't happen all at once, but this is how we become real together. A while ago, I preached a sermon about the Velveteen Rabbit. The rabbit's in the nursery home. Y'all have heard this story too many times by now, but it's my favorite, so I'll share it again. There's a rabbit in the, in the nursery. There's nursery room magic. The toys are alive, and the rabbit is the sawdust rabbit. It's just this old thing. But the boy the, who owns the rabbit loves the rabbit. The boy is talking to this old rocking horse that's been hand me down in the family for generations and is looking at all these toys with lights and gizmos and all the stuff, what does it mean to be real? The rabbit asks the skinned horse. Well, it's not a thing that happens to you all at once, and sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes by the time you're real, your eyes have fallen out and your hair has fallen off and you're very shabby, but you can't be ugly once you're real. You can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. And so however someone comes into this space, friends, with whatever language they speak, with whatever they've been carrying, insofar as they have a heart bent towards openness too, insofar as they have questions, hopefully more questions than answers, that they'll be met with a welcome, with a love, with a patience and an understanding that can make people who for too long have not been allowed to feel human, to feel human, if this is all we did here, and again, it is not, it would be tremendously special. I have been a member of many Unitarian Universalist churches, all of them different, such as Congregationalism. We're all at least a little different, and some of them, some of them don't put that great emphasis on the welcome. They have a really polished worship service, and the building is beautiful, and oh my gosh, but you walk in, and there isn't that immediate welcome. This isn't denigrating on my colleagues or their churches. This is just different. Here, things are different. You can be a bit more warmer or more welcome with a smaller congregation. You can be more adaptable and movable. We can respond to the world, friends, in a faster way. And we can become closer. It's easier to know the names of fewer people than more, right? I think that there is a power in being a small, scrappy, DIY, loving congregation that undergirds all of that realness, that righteousness, that wild, rowdy, wild spirit with that love that is bigger than all of us. That love that calls us back home time and time and time again. You've broken your vows a thousand times. We come back into covenant. We make it right. We return to love and begin again. We may have to do this over and over and over again to really live into our pluralism because pluralism is challenging. It, necessitates a kind of humility. But I believe it can welcome our optimism too. As I mentioned before, optimism, optimism is only folly if it gets tainted with pride or unteachability. But if we can remain in love with this life, holding that flame of optimism, then what can borders do? What can boundaries do? They can still stop people, still hurt people, still keep people safe sometimes, but mostly, mostly I have found that they tend to cut people off from one another. Our, one of our principles calls us to an idea of a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. 
In my mind, y'all, that means a person who was born in Rio de Janeiro could move to New York. A person born in Omaha could move to Belfast or Bangkok. Either way, friends, what does that mean to you? Even as we explore our principles changing, if you're new here, we'll talk about it soon, I promise. But do we believe in generosity, justice, equity, pluralism, transformation, interdependence? If these values speak to us, then it must point towards a world where borders are eased, where love is allowed to grow and flourish. Systems that are closed, friends, that can't change, they break or they break the people that are a part of them. Not so with Unitarian Universalism, and I don't feel that here at Second Unitarian, but I would challenge you, friends, to be in discernment about such systems that are, that are around you, in your workplace, in this country. What systems are curtailing the freedom of the human heart? We don't have devils or iblises or arimans or any great evil so much in Unitarian Universalism. That's not the most important thing for us. But I would identify the forces who would control for control's own sake to hold a critique there and to inquire, to challenge, to struggle, but to struggle on the side of love, like Daryl's lovely shirt. <laughs> to struggle on the side of love, friends to struggle within ourselves, to work through things that may be holding us back from letting love work its demands through us, and I know it's not easy, but you're not alone. You're in the neighborhood, a neighborhood of fellow seekers and fellow travelers, people longing to help one another believe more fully in life. And I believe it's possible. I believe it's not too optimistic just optimistic enough, friends.